Hello, um, it's my seventh time here, and I see a lot of familiar faces, but also uh, a lot of new faces, which is actually uh, really cool. Um, it's always interesting to have a fresh perspective on things. Um, my talk is a bit theoretical, so I really hope that you finish your lunch a bit earlier and not, not now in the last minute, um, and that you also had a bit of a coffee or tea or beverage of your choice that, that uh, allowed you to, you know, really become active. Uh, not to say that my talk is boring, but uh, <laughs> depending <laughs> depending on, on your uh, level of interest in APIs, depending on the fact that you're designing or consuming um, in, some, in some areas might be sometimes a bit more complex or require a bit more attention. So a bit about myself, I'm a senior computer scientist at Adobe. I work in the Basel office. I actually, I'm, I'm Romanian. I actually started in Bucharest in, in 2012 when the uh, what we used to call day team uh, expanded there, and then uh, three years later I moved to Basel. So that, that's why I'm there. Um, I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and uh, at some point uh, down the road I became also a Sling PMC member. Uh, obviously I was a committer before. Um, if you're still using HTL, <laughs> I'm, I'm the HTL uh, maintainer, so I also contribute and, and, and I still maintain it. And you probably saw that I am and was, together with Carl, in, in the past years, very active in the Sling scripting and serverless resolution area. We, we try to improve a few things, try to go into, into a direction where we would have had the option to at least create native images and, and stuff like that. But yeah, it depends, uh, it depends uh, what you want to do and uh, where life takes you. <laughs> and uh, where your company says that, that it's more interesting for you to work. Um, so let's talk about API first. It's, it's a direction which, which we started to follow uh, in, in Adobe, at least in the AM org. Um, you're going to see in the next months to, to a year that a lot of the, the solutions that you're using from AEM are transitioning to an API first approach. Um, Sites was kind of fortunate to have the first set of APIs out in the public. I think Assets is going to come, uh, and Forms, sorry, Forms, they were actually forced. Forms was first, then Sites, and, and, and Assets is going to, to soon come with also a set of APIs. Um, and we started following this, this paradigm of building, of building software, um, which is API first. Um, the way you work in this new paradigm is that you don't start by writing code at all. You try to stay away from that moment as much as possible. And rather try to figure out what are the use cases that you're trying to solve. Uh, where do you have to take that data? Who's going to consume it? How it should look like? Uh, how much is too much? Uh, how much is not enough? Uh, and you try to, to figure out first what should be the contract for putting that information out. Now, um, after, after this process, you can start thinking about the code. Um, and you should treat all of your APIs, no matter if they are uh, public or private, in the same way. So you always start with this layer, API design. Um, to be honest, there is no concept of private API. Somebody is going to consume it. So treat it exactly as you would treat the APIs that you give to your customers. Um, the APIs in this process, in the, in the API first uh, paradigm, they'll have a well-defined life cycle. Um, and this life cycle has a few stages. Um, so naturally, you start with a design phase. This is where you look at the use cases, figure out who are the stakeholders, figure out what they need, and you design the contract that everybody's going to follow, implementation and consumers. After that, you go into the development phase. So this is where you actually start implementing uh, support for those APIs, write your services, um, figure out how they should be orchestrated, and, and so on. Then, stuff that most of us like, some of us don't, testing phase. Here is where you have to make sure that what you designed is actually uh, performing its functions. That you obey not only the contract, but that functionally you are where you're supposed to be. We're going to talk a bit more about the, the testing phase later and why it's important, how many types of testing an API there are. Then you have the documentation and the deployment phase. Now, I said API first, right? It means that you already have the API design. 
Um, depending on how you do it and which style you choose, you might not have to do much. So if you think about OpenAPI or GraphQL, there you already have the definition of the API, which can act as a, as a documentation. You might still need to add a bit of a wording to it to make it nicer. With the GraphQL uh, style of APIs, you already have the schema. In the schema, you can add markdown to document what's happening in, in comments. That's going to get rendered by all the tools. Um, but if you're going with hypermedia APIs, which is also an option, then there you have to do a bit more work. There you actually have to write the proper documentation and, and make sure that you've covered all the types of links and relationships that you might have. Then you have the observation phase, which means that your API is already deployed somewhere, it's out in the wild, and you have to figure out how it performs. Uh, are your response times constant, or if you're very lucky, decreasing because you're optimizing, or do you see that with every change that you push, your response time increases? That's, that's something that, that should give you something to, to think about. Are the response codes the ones that uh, would indicate that the API is used successfully? So you apply mostly with like responses from the 200, series of, of response codes, or suddenly you start replying with 400s or even worse, 500s. Um, and this is the phase where you have to figure out, OK, I have my API out. What are the criteria that makes this API successful? And how do I make sure that if something goes wrong, I can react fast to it? And then nothing is perfect. Nothing lives forever. You might need to deprecate it, either because the API is going to have some new use cases that cannot be fulfilled with the existing contract, or because a security issue came up, and then you also have to change something, or because service goes down for whatever reason. There's no more money to have the service up and running after a certain amount of, uh, of, of months or years. What's the advantage for companies, you're asking? Or not, but I can tell you. <laughs> Um, it increases the productivity of the developers, right? Uh, as Bertrand said, there's no back-end and front-end. It's a team. Some do UI components, some do the back-end services that provide data to those, uh, to those UI components. Uh, in addition to that, it improves the software quality. Because you already have the contract out, you can start writing tests without having any of the implementation behind. When implementation comes in, then you obviously run the test against the implementation but it allows you to do uh, TDD. Um, it allows the companies to produce consistent, coherent, and repeatable APIs. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit more about this in, in, uh, in the next slides. Uh, but basically, if you put one API out and you start having a recipe, and a new API comes that has to fulfill a different set of use cases, you already have some principles or some guidelines from the, the, the first time you did it. And that allows you to, to, to work faster and to, uh, to skip some of the steps when you, when you implement an API, another API uh, down the road. It might introduce a common security framework that all APIs are going to work so that not everybody has to reinvent the wheel uh, in this aspect. And obviously, with security, you don't want to do that and become creative. Um, and then it makes those companies stand out. So as much as we might not like Bezos now or his personal choices, there's this funny memo that you're going to find if you Google it. Uh, so in, in 2002, he created or he sent an email to, to the company, which has now truly been called the APN mandate, where he told the teams, whatever you put out, and that was probably way before web APIs, but still you had APIs in one, one form or, or another. He told them, whatever you put out, whatever services are going to come out, the only way that they're allowed to communicate to each other is via interfaces or APIs. You're not allowed to go in process and, and figure out what the other service is doing. You're not allowed to connect to its database and retrieve stuff from there, which some of us do right, with the repository. We don't go to the Java API. We just go get the value map and, and read stuff. And if you don't do that, he was a bit radical. He said, if you're not do that, you're going to be fired. Now. Radical, yes, sure, but now we're 21 years later, and who kind of rules the internet? Like, how many services do they have out, and how many are actually extremely well documented? Pays off. For developers, it's an intersection of what the advantages for the companies are, right? It allows teams involved to work in parallel. So, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about UI and backend, I'm talking about teams that have to integrate services. They already have the contract, so then they already can start building their separate service that integrates with your API, 
and already uh, create all the infrastructure and, and the design for, for themselves. They don't have to, to wait for the actual implementation to be ready, lose six or seven months down the road, then they figure out that there are bugs and, and, and so on. So it allows the, the teams to really work in parallel. Um, it empowers the teams to build and start innovating. Uh, you have the contract out, that might be a, a longer step to, uh, to, it might take a bit longer to reach to, to, to that point. Uh, but then once that contract is out, they build, they innovate, they figure out, okay, we need a new extension to the API, this is the process that we're going to follow, and then it's out. And then they go to the next one, and the next one, and so on. And what's even more interesting, it levels the field. Various roles, because you already have that contract out, can take those APIs, mocked or not, and start interacting with them, start to orchestrate them and figure out what can I do with this set of APIs? Can I build an app that does this, this, and that? And then you're going to see people, project managers, or people who are doing uh, business analysis, or even C-level positions. There are some crazy CEOs who still write code in, in some companies. They're going to be able to take those APIs and figure out if what you've, uh, what you've built actually makes sense. So there is no API without an architecture behind the scene, right? And there are various styles that, that we can use in our designs. And I already mentioned a few of them before actually all of them from this table. <laughs> in the API first world, I think you have three styles that you could use. Um, and this table is, is not what Adobe would say. It's, it's my personal experience about, about uh, those three styles. So in, interpret it like that. Um, you have open API, you have GraphQL, and you have REST, but the proper REST, not what we call RESTful. Not because it looks, if, if a URI looks like a resource, doesn't mean that it's REST, right? There's a lot that comes into it, which is very well hidden in, in Roy's thesis in, in one section of a chapter, but that's actually what he meant and what probably a lot of us got wrong. So REST is driven by hypermedia. If there's no hypermedia, there's no REST. And you have there two references. One is to the um, um, maturity model, and the other one is to, to an article that actually uh, wrote him, Roy himself wrote about what actually it means to, to fulfill the REST uh, requirements, because not just a set of principles, it has requirements. So I grouped those APIs uh, into um, five categories depending on what you want to do. Uh, developer friendliness means how easy it is to discover them, and um, how easy those styles are kind of self-documenting themselves. And then there's machine friendliness, and this relates to hypermedia. It allows you to create a long-lived uh, client based on those specs. So those specs are stable, and then that client gets the information about that API once, and it doesn't have to do any changes. I mean, think, think about the way the web works, right? We didn't change much from the moment that the web appeared. The protocol changed a bit, but uh, the way that we discover what's available on the web, that hasn't changed that much. So if you take those things into account, oh, I also have to mention what I mean by data plane API, because probably it's not extremely clear. Uh, delivery, it's simple, right? You take content out uh, somewhere. Search API is also simple. Data plane is the, the, the type of API that controls how structured objects are going to be manipulated. Think about CRUD, but then you could also introduce more advanced concepts like versioning, tagging, and, and so on. And you're, you're going to see that also applied in, a, in an API. So if we have those five uh, criteria for the APIs, then you see that they all have their advantages and disadvantages, these three styles. And it really depends on what you want to do. Uh, and like I said yesterday, they're all tools, right? And you have to pick the best tool depending on what you need to, to implement. There is no silver bullet anywhere. Um, and because we're talking about API first, and it's kind of difficult to do it with REST, not impossible, um, I'm actually going to focus this talk a bit more on open API and uh, give you a bit more um, insight about how we, how we use it. But that's a bit later in the talk. <laughs> so the design phase, right? We said that that's, that's very important because that's where the contract starts. Um, in the design phase, we, we define what the API intentions is. We, co we collect the use cases, we figure out what we need to support, and then this tells us which of those three styles, which are very good for API first, um, is going to be the best one to, to pick. Um, after that, 
we have to define the API contract, right? So we know which style we're going to pick, and now is the time when we're going to uh, start defining our API specification, which is binding. It's a contract. You offer something, and somebody who's going to consume that API expects a certain set of uh, capabilities. Then we have the validation phase, where we make sure that the contract actually stands and that the implementation follows it. Then the documentation phase, it's part of the design phase, actually. You, you don't, you don't uh, do that later. And then the whole process has to be somehow guided. Uh, you have to have a framework for the whole design process. And this is kind of the Bible of the API design, the set of API guidelines that tell you uh, how an API should look like depending on, on the styles. If you want the more formal definition is that sentence above, it's, it's, it's quite complex, but it basically tells you what you need to cover with your guidelines and uh, what it provides you with. Right? So it's that, that, the thing that I told you earlier, that you do repeatable, coherent, consistent APIs. Um, and your guidelines should cover quite a few topics. So we already mentioned the API styles. Then you're going to go into the funniest conversations about naming, but it's very good to actually have conventions for how your operations and resources are going to be named, respectively how they're going to be addressed. And um, if you don't do that, then the APIs are not going to look coherent. You might go from one API to the other, and then your consumers, which are most likely developers, are going to be a bit puzzled. So it, it's very good to have those uh, written down from the, from the very start. Then you're going to need that common security framework that I told you, so uh, guidelines or potentially even a security framework that can be applied to all of your implementations. Then we're going to need a way to define the data formats and the schemas that we want to use for our uh, request payloads, respectively for the, for the response bodies. And that's actually something that can uh, define all three styles without, without any issue. Then you're going to want to have a common set of guidelines for error handling specifically, because you want your errors to feel consistent. They have to look the same. The only difference should be what caused it and what's the status code that you're going to, to respond with. If then you're very, very uh, uh, pedantic and you pay a lot of attention to what happens uh, in your system, you might want to provide a set of guidelines for data consistency and caching. And you saw how important caching is. Um, and this, we have a few standards here, so you might not have to do that much in, in, in this area. Probably just follow the standards and, and, and it should be good. And then you have to... Um, select the standards that all of your developers work on API design, but also on consuming those APIs have to be familiar with. Because those on their own are, are their own framework. They also tell you um, how the, how, if we're talking about the web, right, you have the, the, uh, a lot of standards that define how the web works, how caching works, how resources work, uh, what content negotiation means, um, and so on. So you're going to have to include them. But the standards can be internal and external. So external is everything that you can find in the RFCs. Internal, it might be, I don't know, uh, what kind of security practices you have or what kind of libraries you have to use for doing uh, a, certain, a certain thing. So because I was talking about HTTP standards, I'm going to give you a list of non-exhaustive uh, uh, standards that, that all API designers should be familiar with. Uh, they're not that many here. Obviously, it's not the, the non-exhaustive list, because, um, but, but I think that what you have here is, is a very good basis. So obviously, HTTP semantics, uh, the standards have been recently uh, rewritten. It, it's still the same um, content that you're using the 7231 and above standards, but they've been uh, formatted in a way that's easier to, to understand them and to, uh, to make the connections between certain, certain concepts. So now they're separated into semantics and caching. Then you have the additional status codes, um, which here I think three from this standard are very important. Precondition, uh, precondition required. Uh, precondition required is a, is a status that you use when you have an API that requires a conditional header. It would be the if match or the if, uh, if not modified since headers. Um, you might have other preconditions 
uh, but it's something that you would reply to a client that uh, can only execute that operation if a condition is fulfilled. So if, if, if the condition is missing completely, you have to reply with this status. If the condition doesn't apply, then you have to reply with a different one. Then rate limiting is very important nowadays, depending on, on the types of uh, clients that are going to hit your APIs. Uh, request header fields too large, goes into the parsing of the, of the message. It's also extremely important to, to know about. And then, depending on how you like to edit your, your, your data, I'm a very big fan of JSON patch and JSON merge patch. There are two formats for granularly sending uh, editing information to your server. So instead of editing a resource and sending the full resource body with, with the changes embedded there, you can instruct the, the server what it needs to change in a, in a very granular way. Like you could change just one property and the whole request body is like two lines. There are two main uh, standards, so JSON patch, JSON merge patch. If you're if you like rules, you probably are going to go for JSON patch. If you want to be a bit more relaxed, you're going to go with JSON merge patch. There is one very important difference. The second one, JSON merge patch, cannot be used to send null values in case your application relies on them. So a null there would just remove the property. And then there's an extension in this standard is the patch method, which is not included in the core HTTP methods. Uh, but the patch method is the one that uh, allows you to send a set of instructions to the server about how to modify a resource. And then the error handling that I told you earlier is the problem detail standard. It's a standard that includes five properties uh, to describe errors. You have status, which the, it's the equivalent of the status code. There is a title, uh, which is a human readable name. There is a type, uh, which is a URI, which could give specific details about that error. So don't think about just, I don't know, a bad request of 400. You actually have, can create a specific problem type where you tell uh, the client of your API, this is the actual problem that happened. You didn't send this value in between those ranges, for example. Um, and then would be, because nothing is forever, the sunset header, uh, which is a header, it's a date header that tells your uh, consumers when an API is going to be shut down. So you, if you know that you're going to deprecate something, it would be good to, uh, to provide this information. We were talking about API testing earlier, and I told you that I have a, a chapter in the slides about that. We have four categories for API testing. There's contract and functional, so which is one category in its own. Uh, contract is basically your API specification. Functional is how your implementation obeys that specification. Uh, usually, you work with a tuple of request response, and you make sure that for a certain input, you get a certain output. Um, obviously, it's not only comparing uh, that, that thing directly, but rather looking if both obey the schemas that your API has, has defined for, for them. Then you can do load testing to figure out uh, what's the breaking point of your API and figure out where you have bottlenecks. Then you have the security testing, which is extremely important to, to do way before you start launching your API into the public. And then there's the fast testing, which I actually like, uh, which is trying to verify the behavior of your implementation uh, when you send input that's malformed or invalid or unexpected. Remember the funny JSON uh, talk from yesterday? Although that was on the response side. So for contract testing, what we figured out at Adobe is that there's a super nice library that, that we can all use. Uh, it's, I think it's under an Apache license. It's called Rest Assured. Um, it's written in Groovy, but you can consume it on the JDK. So if you look at this example, it's a very simple one. Assume that you have a, a, a lottery result with those numbers. If you really want to test what happened, you do a request to your lottery results. Um, then you check that the status code was 200, and then you make sure that the body uh, contains some information that, that you expect. It's, it's, I think, the simplest way to write REST tests and still have them written uh, using Java. Um, Bertrand, I know that he's a very uh, big fan of uh, Karate. It's a, it's a different framework. It's al it also allows you to write expressive tests, but I think this is a bit closer to what we're usually uh, uh, writing. Uh, but that covers only the part of the, the test, right? Um, you didn't test your specification if you only wrote a, a REST assured test, right? Um, there is a project from Atlassian called the Swagger Request Validator. And this one provides uh, validators for different testing libraries. 
that you can use injecting those test libraries and make sure that your request response pairs conform to the API specification, that they contain the properties that you've defined, that you haven't missed any required property from your output, that the media type is correct, that you reply with the correct headers, and so on. The way that you would link them, you would just instantiate your open API validation filter. That's the name of the, the class. You pass it an open API specification file, or a URI, from where it parses your API and builds all the, all the validation rules. And then in the second section of the code that you see down, you attach the filter. You have the option to write your own custom uh, uh, validators, and then they can be divided into request or response validators, or both. You have an example there of a, of a filter, or a val sorry, a validator, the ETag one, that can do both. So you can apply more custom logic if you need to. Um, and that's the whole thing. So with these two examples, you test not only the contract, but also the functionality of your implementation. So how can you do this in Sling or in AEM? Because as you well know, the way that we parse the request in Sling is a bit exotic, to call it the least. Um, you are going to need a, a dedicated servlet context where you're going to deploy your APIs. Uh, API is just an example. You can, you can pick whatever path you want. It doesn't really matter. And then you can still bridge into the resource tree uh, using the authentication support. Uh, this one already tells you if the request is authenticated, gives you the current access resource, and it already has a resolver attached to it. And from there on, even if you're not writing a Sling servlet, you can still access the resource tree, go and fetch your information, filter process, and, and so on. Then you implement your API with the help of regular servlets. Uh, but if you uh, really have um, your software uh, chops high, <laughs> you would delegate, because the servlet does too much. You have a do get, do post, and, and so on, and that's way too much. That's not describing an operation. That's describing what you're going to do when you encounter a certain request. But open API, in open API, an operation is the uh, topple between a request and a resource. And I would delegate and I would implement uh, my API with, with something a bit more fine-grained uh, fine that would only handle that operation and, and not more. Um, then uh, you configure rest assured and swagger, the, 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 the validator that I told you about, and then you profit. So what have we learned by, by using the API-first approach and uh, these set of tools? Invest time in your API guidelines. Uh, there's a funny tweet from one of my colleagues, which I forgot to embed. <laughs> but he said that after he's been working with API first, he realized that he spends 90% of the time in doing the design and 10% in the implementation. And that doesn't mean that we're slow. It means that the guidelines and the API design is the most important part. And that once that's cleared, the rest is easy peasy, right? It's 10% of the time. Um, Obviously, keep up to date with the standards. Uh, figure out what's, what's coming up new. Figure out if there's a, a, an errata published to any of the standards, uh, because you really want to work with standards. Interoperability, interoperability is the key to success. You don't want to build something exotic. You don't want to be something that, that locks uh, anybody into your, uh, into your solution. And then contract testing. Test your specification and implementation together. Do not disconnect them. As soon as you've done that, you lost the game. What have we learned? Well, if you can generate the spec ahead of time, right? because you write that, you definitely can deploy code generators to make sure that whenever you change something, your errors are compile time errors and not runtime errors. They're the easiest ones to catch. So if there's a code generator for the programming language of your choice, use it, figure out what makes sense to have as a, as a generated class, uh, and, and leave that to them. Um, developing in parallel was definitely not a myth. So uh, you're gonna, some of you might have seen the, the, content, the new Content Fragments editor. That one was developed using an API-first approach. We gave the spec to the, to the UI team, well, the UI team, the UI members of the team, actually. Uh, they started writing their components because they knew what they were getting, and then once the implementation was ready, they actually started running their test against the API. And then um, the API-first moves the focus to what's important, which is the contract that you offer to your users. You have an example 
a, a real life example of what happens when you follow the process. So it's, it's this API that you can start looking at. And um, I think you're going to figure out that it, it's, it's coherent, at least within itself right now. Thank you. And thank you for having patience, because I was quite fast with the presentation. <laughs> Well, I take questions if there are any. This is actually, that was the API. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So it's, it's what I said yesterday in the, in the panel talk. Fragments models, crowd support for them, tagging, variations, uh, versioning, and, and so on. You can, you can go ahead, uh, look at it. You can download the open, a open API specification and, and figure out how it works. I'm going to send the slides so that you actually have the link. You don't have to try to squint and figure out what the link is. <laughs> Thank you, Rado, for explaining us how we <laughs> built our APIs. And oh, yeah, now a question popped up. So uh, <laughs> is it possible to generate code, for example, servlets in AEM from open API? No. You would, you <laughs> <laughs> it's a very simple answer. Uh, no, because then you would need a tool that, um, that understands the open API, so it uses a Swagger parser. And then you would have to have proprietary code that generates the servlets. And as I said before, you don't want to actually have servlets. The servlets are going to only intercept your request. But then you should delegate that request to a processor that only handles one operation from the, uh, from the API definition and not more. Imagine that you have a resource. And for the same resource, you can do a get to retrieve it. You can do a, a, a post to, to create a, a new entry in a collection. Um, or if you're working with only one resource, you can do a, a get, a patch, a delete. You don't want to implement that whole functionality in the server. You're going to end up with like a few hundred lines of code. Models, what you can do with the, with the current generator is you can either decide to generate code for the whole API, so you're going to have an API client or a server, uh, which have methods for accessing all the operations, plus the models, which are the, the, the schemas of your, of your request bodies or response bodies. Or you can go more granular and say, I'm only interested in the models, which is usually what you want to do, because clients, uh, they're kind of clunky the way that they're generated, but the models are spot on. And another thing that I, I forgot to mention, if you use the generators, especially the Java ones, uh, some of them come with a Jakarta validation framework baked in. So if you have um, restrictions in your open API definition where you say that an array has a minimum number of items and a max, they're going to automatically insert, I think they call them, um, I forgot how they call them. Uh, it's a, it's a specific, sorry? Constraints, yes, yeah, thanks. They, they, they define constraints. And there are a lot of out-of-the-box constraints. But the cool thing is that the API allows you to write your own custom constraints. So you'd use the same framework. I'm always curious. This framework is really good. What process should be adopted to minimize rework when there is a need to change the contract mid-development, as multiple teams would be using this to develop parallelly? Um, well, if you're doing the development process, uh, it's as simple as changing the, the schema and making everyone aware of the, of the changes to the schema, and then, then they can adapt. If you're after the fact, after you made the API public, uh, your guidelines should include a huge chapter which is going to be talked over and over about versioning. And there are different ways to do it. I'm not going to go into the discussions. It traumatized me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Radu. Thank you, too.